Hi, uh, welcome back to our third version um, of our facilities roundtable. So uh, seeing some familiar names and faces, but again, we'll do some uh, quick uh, introductions just so people are familiar with with the individuals that'll, that'll be kind of leading our group. So I'm Jess Gentry, I'm Associate Director at the University of Illinois. I'm also joined by Aaron Wells, who is an Associate Director at UT Austin and Amy Lanham, who is a senior associate director at Nebraska Lincoln. So um, we'll be kind of interjecting, you know, throughout the conversation, trying to, to lead and encourage that engagement. We'll also be keeping a, an eye on the chat box. So um, this group has always been good about dumping stuff in there and, you know, hopefully we get to it. But if we don't, um, you know, it seems everyone's always enjoyed seeing just the different examples um, of things. So um, obviously things have changed quite a bit. I think for everybody in the time since we last met. But again, as you know, we were just talking to see how we wanted, you know, to prepare for this and, and go for the conversation and just, you know, the, kind of the overwhelming sense that we've had, just trying to think about what some of this stuff looks for us as um, we get closer and closer to what a reopening could look like. Um, we decided just to start, you know, to kind of separate ourselves from our institutions and our situations and just brainstorm as a group of collegiate rec professionals about the things we need to keep in mind to open um and you know try to stay out of the weeds i'm sure we'll have a chance to kind of get into some more specific things later um in the call but we're just trying to think about regardless of area what are the questions we need to ask um what are the different things we need to keep in mind um to reopen so hopefully that like I said, we're not, we don't get that overwhelming sense of like, I don't even know how we're going to go about this. And then it just, it gets super hard to kind of conceptualize and talk about. So um, that's, like I said, that's going to be where we're start. We're starting, you know, feel free to shoot out different questions. Again, you know, use the chat box as you like, and, you know, we'll go from there. So anyone want to get us started about, you know, the questions we need to ask or the things, you know, we need to figure out and keep in mind when we start thinking about how we go about reopening our spaces and our facilities and our programs? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, how many people are really considering the use of um, touchless thermometers to take temperature readings either for the patrons or even our student staff side? Actually, we, we just started thinking about that. We started talking about it yesterday. We haven't made any determinations on what we're going to do at this point, but hopefully we'll get some information out of this discussion and I can bring back to the, the rest of our team to talk about. One thing that was brought up um, in the risk management session yesterday was um, if we're allowed to do that type of stuff at this point in time, like is HR going to let us do that? So I think a big conversation has to happen with your legal and your HR department to know if that's even a possibility for your area. I know a lot of this stuff is going to depend on your geographical, um, what your local municip municipalities are coming out with in regards to opening guidelines. I know that we saw Tennessee's and Wyoming's yesterday, I believe. Um, so make sure you're reading those and if it's and what's what's in those as well. Yeah, thank you. And I should let off uh, Michael Montgomery Central Washington University, uh, Washington being a hot spot um, and also kind of following. So we are under uh, we believe we're following Idaho's guidance on some of these as well. Uh, we just uh, as preface, we are in collaboration with our student medical center on campus. So if it's not us doing readings, is it a nurse practitioner or something like that? But um, just kind of starting the conversation because uh, I know when I drop my daughter off at daycare, they take her temperature reading and everything says like, if you show symptoms, don't come to work, but we know students want to come back to work, so. Yep, and uh, you guys may have already noticed this, but a couple people have already dumped a few um, documents that have some guidelines that their universities are utilizing into the chat box. So um, if you want to take a look at those or download them and look at them later, there are already some resources available. 
in there. Uh, anyone else just thinks we need to be keeping in mind, like you don't need, they can be questions. None of us have the solutions to any of this at this point, um, but just kind of brainstorming of all of the different T's we gotta, gotta cross and the I's we gotta dot. So kind of playing off like what Michael was asking about. So let's talk, can we start with staffing? What are the things we need to think about when it comes to staffing, re-staffing our facilities and keeping people safe? So what are the things that you all are thinking about when it comes to staffing? Availability, yep. PPE. So like, what about the safety of the staff, Jasmine? What are, what are some, what are some things that you're thinking about for that? So here at the University of Iowa, I know we have uh, talked about maybe implementing a plexiglass at the front desk, um, just to give uh, some type of security to um, our students, between our students and the patrons that do come in. Awesome, awesome. Someone mentioned, you know, managing access. So, you know, is that one in, one out? Are we using, you know, the different softwares that our, our respective departments might have to, you know, sign up um, for a space? Does anybody have any insight into what maybe they've thought about or what their campuses are considering doing around managing that access piece? This is Nino here from Ryerson. Uh, I have the same question whether we allow a software to be used online for people to register for workout time slots. Maybe cap them at an hour each and then in between those hours staff can clean when the facility is empty for 15 or 30 minutes. Or do we let, I don't have the number figured out yet, but do we let 100 people in our facility. Normally we have three or 400. Do we let 100 people in and then when the cap is hit do we do a one in one out i have the same question and if we do a software for registration for workout time slots is there one that's free i'm up in canada at ryerson i'm, I'm assuming a lot of you are from probably from the us so I, I don't know if there's a software we can use that can handle that amount of registration for 100 time slots at the same time i don't know and you know it's tj over at mac actually um what few, what what software are you guys running at ryerson we have fusion. So I would and just we have, a, we have another one for massage therapy. I don't know what it's called because the customer service staff use it, but they have a different software for massage registration that is accessible online. Yeah, so we use fusion as well and we're set up online. Um, we probably could look at from that standpoint for those that do use fusion the um, uh, squash court software sign up piece yeah. and adjusting it to your well, like like the calendar. Center. Yeah, we use, we use calendar to book squash courts and spaces. Yeah, which you could probably adjust uh, because of how you have to open it up to the public or not, because like, you can't book one of our yeah. our gym facilities that way. But we we could amend it to look to use as a built-in software that you already have. Hey, TJ and Nino, Nino, it's uh, Pam from Innisoft. I'm going to put a link in the Slack chat of a video showing you how to do that, like how we would recommend which part of the software to use from Fusion. To do oh, that. great. And in, in the comments, someone also mentioned I am leaves has some functionality, a few different ways to look at considering doing this. So I think most of us use I am leaks for, you know, the intramural piece, but um, I know we had looked at I am leaves even just to do sign up for group fitness classes, you know, prior to any of this happening. And that was a possibility that that offered too. So I would imagine just with, with just some adaptation, it, it could likely um, control these signups and such as well. Um, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. First time here, Lisa Gagnon. I'm from the University of Moncton, uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I was actually just working on something, um, well, this week with uh, people from uh, the Atlantic provinces in Saskatchewan. And um, I, I kind of had a little brainstorming that I'm going to share with my staff and um, I was just, I had a bunch of questions, but I put a lot of things 
that I, how I would see it functioning when people would walk in, like, I don't know if this is the place to say this, but, um, you know, we'd have a sign at the beginning, with, which is um, from the public health, public health sign, and you come in and you have one way in and a one way out. Um, we'd have, um, I've written everything in French, so I got to translate it, so. Um, <clears throat> so we we identify as well when you're coming in. We'd identify with lines. You're 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 two meters apart, so you don't you don't um, you have to stay two meters apart until you get to the um, the swipe card. Um, we thought we'd put um, a plexiglass or a glass around the um, reception area. Only that we wouldn't accept cash. We'd only take Interact or uh, MasterCard. I don't know if you guys already talked about this. It's my first time here, so um, we wouldn't do um, we wouldn't do any um, locations like for uh, um, uh, towels, towel distributions. Uh, we would stop that completely. Um, even bin caps, we wouldn't do that. Any. <gasps> Rentals right now, we wouldn't do that. We're just talking about it. Um, we'd have a maximum of people in our in our in our weight room and in cardio room. Um, we'd have staff because we have two rooms: one for the cardio, one for the weight room. We'd have one staff in each room uh, to monitor. We do a fusion for um, reservation, so like the one hour reservation, and then. Um, we do a 15 minute cleanup or a 20 minute cleanup. So that's that's where I'm at right now. And I have so many questions as well. So people have mentioned also just kind of looking at the comments, um, can, using some functionality in Connect2 uh, to do some things is what people are looking at. Also someone suggested Qualtrics. Um, you can adapt some of their surveying functions um, that could act as a sign up as well if your, you know, university or institution has a license to utilize that. So, um, you know, looks like there, there's a lot of good options um, of stuff, you know, we can keep trying uh, as, a, as a field if this is something that we're um, going to want to do. Uh, Max put an interesting comment in um, just about what they're looking at Swarth Swarthmore to be doing as far as kind of their transition of people using the facility. So Max, do you want to touch base on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Max Miller, Swarthmore College. Um, we have a 21,000 square foot fitness center, a uh, small liberal arts college outside of Philadelphia. Um, all on campus activities are canceled until at least July 31st. So just thinking uh, for the future now. So to start, um, start only allowing students to use um, and then phasing it into transitioning to allowing faculty and staff, then permitting dependents of those faculty and staff members, then permitting alumni, and then eventually guest passes and being back to normal with um, sort of patron, uh, patron access to the facility. Um, and then in addition um, for this space, um, I'm, my plan is to take offline the free weight area squat racks and um, benches to only permit the use of selectorized equipment and then spreading out the selectorized equipment to that free weight area so that there's no um, to sort of create a path for people to use um, and easily mark on the floor what areas people can use and what areas people can and what equipment that can be used and that cannot be used. And then, you know, Max, not to pick on you again, but you talked, it looked like you kind of had a transition plan as far as, you know, you'd only start with students to be able to use and you kind of gradually broadened that as assuming things, you know, yeah. keep trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, students to start um, transitioning to them, faculty and staff, dependents, um, alumni and then guests. Um, we do not have memberships. Um, all alumni are permitted to use our facility, our athletic facilities um, upon graduation, um, as long as they have um, uh, a one card from our uh, one card office um, and have completed the appropriate waiver. Um, and then, uh, so my thought process behind it is students are paying the student fee, so they should be first priority to have access and work here for the students. Um, faculty and staff, it's a fringe benefit of being a, uh, an employee of the college. 
Um, so starting out with those who are paying the student fees in order to utilize the facilities on campus and then um, working towards those other constituents on campus who um, can benefit from the services. Thanks, Max. So there's been some conversation about, um, you know, how do we protect our frontline staff? So um, are people, you know, moving their swipe stations? Is anyone going, does, you know, anyone using a service that has a contactless feature to where, you know, we don't have that, what's been the traditional exchange of, you know, some kind of ID that's swiped by staff and then returned? Nino from Ryerson here again. Our, our turnstiles have a contactless tap. We use what we call one cards um, through, we use Fusion for our software, but that's to install so turnstiles like that. I don't know if you can get into it, but it's, it's wiring, it's infrastructure, it's 20, 30, 40 grand for a set of turnstiles like that too, right? right. So I'm not sure what you can get into to set up a a tap, a tap system instead of a swipe or whatever. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the technology there, but that one's a tough one for sure. Well, I think somebody had a really good point of, is it possible to move the scanning device? So it's on the other side of the desk so that they can scan their own ID, but it still pops up on your screen. That's, that is what we did. We have a, um, it reads the QR code on it or the barcode and it's usually facing towards the employee. We just flipped it and faced it towards the participants and let them put their card under it. That's what we had switched to at Illinois too. Um, in the weeks that were leading up to all this was we moved our swiper and then just asked people to swipe it on their own and then wait for our staff to acknowledge that they were able to enter. And for the week or two that we did that, it, it wasn't too big of a challenge with that transition. So I would imagine that's something we'll keep in place when we return to um, operation. So there's been a few comments about um, how to, you know, mitigating the risk of our usage. So obviously it's, you know, even under normal circumstances, we can't eliminate any risk in our spaces. So how do we go about mitigating that and um, whether it's from, you know, providing first aid or providing spotter, you know, if, if we allow, I know some departments hire staff to provide spotting for users, some, you know, other users will just, you know, spot for their friends or other individuals, but, you know, any thoughts around how we might go about that, assuming that at least some of us are probably still going to be expected to maintain some social distancing protocols. Has anyone decided not to allow spotters one way or another at this point in time? I think Max wrote in the comments that they had said no, they would not be allowing it. Um, all right, there's been some uh, conversation in the chat as well just about what do we do in the locker room? So do we do, you know, directional aisles, you know, kind of like we, you know, they've adapted in some grocery stores. How do we, again, mitigate this risk to make our locker rooms still accessible if our facilities are open. So any, any thoughts anyone's got around that? We're not opening our locker rooms at all. Restrooms will be open, but locker rooms will be closed. I think it's all, that's another one that goes back to geographical location because some state regulations have allowed locker rooms to be open and some have not. So I think that's gonna go back to it and then what part of the locker room, like we've talked about just the toilet area of our locker room being open because it's bigger and wider than just like a restroom. In a restroom, it's a little bit harder to social distance, but in our locker room where there's a little bit more room between toilets and hallways and stuff. So that's one of the conversations that we've been having. 
but not allowing showers, changing access to lockers. We were going to do the same thing at Ryerson. No lockers, no showers, but obviously allow people to use toilets. Yeah, this is Ken with Cal State Fullerton. We're looking at doing the same thing with our locker rooms. Um, we just, the locker room is our only restroom on the first floor of our building. So we have to keep them open anyway. Um, but coming up with some way of closing down the locker bays and the showers and just having access to the toilet areas is, is kind of the direction that we're leaning. And, and how are people planning to manage that? Is it just literally putting up a barrier and a sign or is people looking to staff that? Cause then you're talking budget, right? Well, I know at, at Fullerton, we, I was just talking to our director about it yesterday. We're probably going to be looking at some sort of barrier and signage, um, something a little, a little more firm than caution tape, um, but something because we have we have six bays in each of our locker rooms, so having to control that and make it, if someone wants to climb over the barrier, they're going to climb over the barrier because we just we can't put somebody in the locker room at all times, but at least try to deter it as much as possible. So just a follow-up question to that will be, uh, is anybody opening a pool? And if so, what are you doing for showering before entering the pool? Well, we haven't made a decision yet on if we're opening our pool, but we also, we have a shower on our pool deck. Um, so so we're, we're covered with that. Just um, we're, we're waiting on whether or not we're gonna be opening our pool deck. We're up in the air on that. Again, that one goes back to what your area and local government are allowing you to do, because I know that Wyoming is allowing pools, but like state of Texas, pools aren't until the fourth phase. So it's going to be a lot of um, what your areas are letting you do when it comes to allowing pool access. So is any, I mean, I think the, we got into the pool conversation a little bit with the locker rooms, but um, any other specifics around pools, you know, questions about that, you know, people are wondering how we might best address or have we kind of exhausted that at this point? All right, um, I think this got briefly touched on, but let's go back to it just to see if there's more conversation to be had. You know, the idea of, you know, I know a lot of us have different versions of the gym wipes um, that we ask our users to use. Um, some have spray bottles and towels that are rewashable. I know we have um, gym wipes and spray bottles with paper towels, um, just in the spaces where it's harder to get some of those the, the gym wipe things installed. So where are people out with those kinds of things? All right, I mean, so I under, you know, obviously, you know, using a reusable towel is gonna offer a different level of you know, whether it's going to be contaminated and reused kind of thing. So it wouldn't surprise me if that's something that people shy away from. Even same thing with the spray bottle, you know, you can throw away a paper towel, but um, there's still places of contact on that spray bottle that aren't getting wiped down um, initially either. So again, uh, just something to think about. So um, what else are, are all of you thinking about or what do we need to be thinking about? What questions um, do we need to be asking again, knowing none of us have the answers at this point in time? Hey, Jess. This is, this is Ben from Boise State. I had a question going off what you're talking about there, because that's been a huge thing we've been trying to figure out is we use spray bottles now, and that just seems to be problematic because it's a community thing and it's going to be hard to track. Are those schools that use gym wipes or various products like that, are you all able to like actually get enough of them right now to mm -hmm. operate. So if that's an option, which it seems like it's a good option, but if every business is doing that, is that gonna be possible in the future? Yeah, Dustin at ASU actually put in the comments that he's experienced sourcing wipes is difficult. And I, and I think uh, to that point, if you didn't buy them early on, you probably can't get them during an opening phase 
as we've looked around, you know, somebody did mention the Zajek's wipes. Those are the same ones that we utilize as well. Um, so we do have a little bit enough to get us off the ground and, and open. But I mean, if you look around at all the, the vendors, it's very difficult to source that maybe as a first option. Um, so potentially utilizing some sort of combination spray. Uh, I think somebody just put in uh, a, a bleach mixture or paper towels so that we're not reusing um, towels might be an option as well. Um, oh my God. So it, it could be difficult to start. Uh, Bruce Walter, University of Oklahoma. Um, one option that we've been doing, we've been using Virex 2 256 for quite a while. We have a supply of it and we've been able to get some again to build up our supply through Granger. Uh, a studio supply there. And we've been offering that out for members because once that's Alluded, you don't have to have any PPE to use it. So it's perfectly safe without gloves, without all that. Uh, so we've been doing that with uh, washcloths. Hey, Bruce, we couldn't really understand you. You were breaking up really bad. Can you, could you put what you said in the chat? Right. <laughs> My internet's having some issues. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've been doing Virex 256 because uh, it doesn't require PPE once it's diluted out. That was washcloth customers uh, that were buying in bulk. You're still breaking up, Bruce. Yeah, Absolutely. if you just want to uh, put your info in the comments, since we're having a hard time capturing it, then, you know, we will, we go. can manage that. I think, it, that I, think I heard a lot of what he was saying, something with a product okay. called 256, and he's buying cleaning cloths or rags. They're trying to buy a mass amount okay. of wipe uh, like cloths or rags so they can use this cleaning product he has. But yeah, I didn't catch maybe 100% of it. Thanks, Nino. No problem. It's there now, so you guys can scroll back through the chat if you'd like to see it, so. Thanks, Amy. Uh, someone, uh, Kristen Watts has asked, you know, is anyone using the Wissy Wash? I've never heard of this, so I'm sorry if I just totally absolutely butchered that. No, um, you're so good. Large scale aquatic center disinfection. <laughs> We received a recommendation from Spear Corporation today for Wizzy Wash, so I wanted to see if anybody else was using it. I have never heard of that. <laughs> I'm sorry. They have a catchy name, though, so. <laughs> has, has anyone heard of Clorox Total or Clorox Pro 360? Yes. It's like a cleaning cart. Yep. Uh, that you push around with a nozzle that you mist equipment with? You know, it's a, um, what it is, is it, it takes a liquid formula and it hydrostatically charges it so that it becomes a mist. And then you can spray your areas and it clings to any surface and disinfects it within four minutes or something like that. And it, do and it does cling to any mm -hmm. surface. Like all surfaces are got some kind of electrostatic charge that it'll cling to. From what, so you, from the, what we understand, the University of yeah. Texas ordered two of them. We haven't gotten them yet, but we've ordered we've ordered two of them. Um, and it's okay. From what we understand, yeah. Is it okay on fabrics? Is it, is it okay on urethane coated dumbbells? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. That's what we're like. That's the main thing that we're hoping for is to clean our dumbbell racks, and and so we're gonna put yeah we're gonna oh, yeah, put that's, all of our of our, clean those. of our weight room. Nino, up at Mac, I, I put in the chat there. We, we sent our products up here. We uh, we've purchased uh, just two Dynafogger, um, which are basically the same thing. It's just a mister. It's just hand um, with a, a tank on the bottom, and we use a product called Ultra Light, which is basically the same thing. It's basically electrostatic charge, really really strong bleach smelling 
cleaner, about 500 parts per mil, and it's it's registered to clean in um, healthcare settings and all those types of things. So if you call Todd at Send Products, um, he would uh, be able to help you out with that. We we find it very effective. We purchased it because we were having in Patago and stuff and with our wrestling teams and rugby teams and stuff and found a, a massive decrease when we started using this even just once a week. Well, it yeah. doesn't power dry. It costs four, four grand for a unit. Ooh, geez. Ross, correct me if I'm wrong. It does have an hour dry time. Like it kills within four minutes, but you have to let it set for an hour, correct? Yeah, our SOP is going to be that we spray our, all of our surfaces in our, in our main weight room uh, at close of our facility. And so then it'll have overnight to do its thing. Um, but yeah, that's what we understand is that it, it kills the virus within four minutes, but for it to become dry to the touch or whatever it needs to do, it, it needs like an hour. I have a question on that 360 for any of the institutions that use it. Um, are you spraying it directly onto the electronic consoles of like the cardio equipment? I mean, weight equipment. Yeah. It's probably, fine but i'm more concerned about the consoles of the cardios yeah ken someone had mentioned in the comments i've lost track of it but if you keep it at least two feet so away fly. um it's it doesn't damage the consoles as long as you stay at least two feet away from it and you're not spraying it directly on it so if that's incorrect from what i captured by all means whomever put that in there please let me know but that's what i did see is i was trying to keep an eye on things I would also add this, uh, we've talked about the 360, you know, quite a bit, and I know it came up in our first round table, which was, you know, over a month ago at this point, but I remember someone at that time saying when they were trying to order one, it was a six to eight week lead time a month ago. So I would assume that's done nothing but increased at this point in time. So if it's, um, it, it's, I mean, it's been very well reviewed and all the times we've talked about it as far as what it can do you know, people liking what it does, it being effective. Um, it's a little pricey, but, you know, for, for the good job that it does and what we're able to do, it, it seems worth it. Um, so if that's something that you think your department's going to want to pursue, I would jump on that as soon as you feel like you're able to do so. And I think we have to good, I mean, we don't have a lot of justification for a lot of things right now, but being able to keep our spaces clean um, seems like it would be high priority on the list if we're wanting to reopen. So just a heads up on that lead time that I would imagine it's more than six to eight weeks at this point now. Well, and somebody commented that it's taking them now two to four months wait time okay. um, from Aaron. But one of the things that we researched because we were behind the curve of having one is that our athletic department has supplies as well as our housing. And so that's a piece of equipment right now we're, we're sharing until ours arrives. Um, so that may be something you want to check in with your facility operations folks too, to see if there is, any potential for, for shared services. Um, someone just asked for, you know, the, those facilities of ours that are LEED certified, um, are there any good, you know, green disinfectants that would meet those expectations that you've been able to find or use? Have we checked the CDC recommendations to see if there's anything on there? That would be my first. All right, so we need to keep looking into that for our for our lead facility friends. Brad, did you want to comment further on what you listed there from Ecolab? Yeah, sure. Um, early on, before things really started to get hot and heavy, we uh, through our vendor, they were able to provide us a list of EPA approved uh, solutions from other vendors that was compatible with the 360 machine. And um, I'll, I'll dig through my emails and, uh, and post that, but uh, Ecolabs and several other uh, name brand and off-brand solutions were approved to run through the 360 device. Uh, Ross just posted a link from the EPA about um, disinfectants that can be used against the COVID-19. Hey, this is Ian Brown from Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, just reaching out to everybody. 
sorry I brought up what seems to be uh, like beating a dead horse here with the, the wipe conversation. Uh, I was, I'm wearing many hats here right now, so I'm late to join the, the facilities group. <clears throat> but one question I have, which might have already been covered too, mm -hmm. is I'm curious what the interplay has been between um, a contracted custodial staff and your existing facility staff. Like, how, what's the conversation like besides talking about the disinfectant scheduling and things like that? But, like, you know, I know that they're going to go through and disinfect the facility two times per, per day. Are other staffs going through and re making their rec department and do an additional cleaning on top of that? Or are they sticking with trying to increase their custodial, their contracted custodial staff? I can say that we are increasing our contract custodial. Not only are we going to utilize our um, employees on shift, but we are increasing our contact, our contract custodial. So for like in this case, are you, do you use an electric uh, static uh, sprayer in addition to the custodial staff? Or do you ask that that contractor purchase that device and you use it when they're not using it? That's kind of where I'm going. Okay, great question. We are purchasing it, but they will be using it. Because our contract may change. It might not always be the same um, company. So we want to make sure that we have the equipment. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I realize my, my, screen, my video might not be pulled up on your case. It's okay. Um, so another question that just came in the chat box from Jessica is um, if anyone has equipment check out, how are you, you know, is that still something you're going to offer in whether it's an initial phase, a later phase? Um, and then when you do eventually offer it, you know, how are you going about the disinfecting piece of that and such? So I'll, I'll jump in. So we are limiting our, our lending, uh, but also when we reopen in phase one, we're not opening our courts uh, just for belief that uh, pickup games will be too tempting to just get going. And it's hard to marshal, hey, you can shoot, shoot with your, by yourself, but one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, is difficult. So uh, we, to make that easy across the board, we're just going to stop gear lending. I think when it gets challenging is when you start also talking about facilities that have climbing walls and those soft goods in lending. So um, I think phase one will be no, and then we'll slowly implement um, as we stagger on. Courtney from Arizona, is that what you're thinking too about phase one, no, but then introducing it as you go? Yeah, it was definitely a topic of conversation between uh, our colleagues here is just, there's too much back and forth about how we can maintain the cleanliness of the equipment for non-porous versus porous. And so we're just gonna initially cut it out, so. So to piggyback on that, and obviously this might be taken care of as you know Mike mentioned, if you're not gonna open the courts, but if we aren't going to allow if, if these spaces for activities are for whatever reason going to be available, are we, would we allow people to bring in their own equipment? Again, not knowing what that, what their own disinfecting at home kind of looks like and, you know, not wanting to be too judgmental about that. Um, but thinking about things from that perspective. I think from our standpoint, it definitely comes down to the patron's discretion. I think that's the balancing act that we kind of had is just um, between staff using their own equipment versus um, having no equipment to use at our facility. So for example, like we're keeping our racquetball courts and squash courts open, um, but they're able to bring their own equipment in. So it's kind of a balancing act there. It's a little bit of a gray area. So people, again, just if you're not catching them or you want to go back and look, there's a lot of good links um, to info being dumped into the, the chat box. So please feel free to keep doing those if you, if you all have 
um, any of them. I know I'm having a hard time keeping up with them and I'm sure others are as well, but that's a great thing for us to be able to go back and look at and really dive into um, ourselves. Um, so, you know, thinking about this reopen, has anyone looked at um, what their hours would be? And again, this probably looks differently. It sounds like everyone's kind of trying to phase this out. Um, what are those hours looking like? Is anyone considering like a, a midday closure to do a little more deep cleaning before you reopen for the rest of the day? Um, you know, has anyone had any conversations around those kinds of things? We've had some. Um, I don't think we've come to a consensus or an answer, but our facility is open Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. till 1 a.m. And then on weekends, um, 8.30 till about uh, midnight. Um, but yeah, we're, we're most likely going to look at scaling back, particularly in the fall, if there's not students back on campus, um, that we will probably scale back our hours and if we open at all. I know at Boston College, we were, it's a plan that we had beforehand, um, but thinking of we're normally open 6 a.m. to about midnight, um, Monday through Friday. So instead of being open 6 to 9 a.m. And then for a noon hour, 11 to 1, close again for a couple hours and reopen from 3 to 7. So that gives us a couple of times throughout the day to be able to close and still gives morning, lunch hour, and post-work time just in case people needed it. So it's just something where we're looking into. Yeah, so it looks like Ian and Christian, um, their institutions are closing midday. So again, you know, it looked like Ian's institution is only closing for about a little over an hour. I, uh, I don't know how long Texas A&M is closing. Um, but what type of cleaning are you doing in that interim? Um, obviously, it's not the same as having, you know, six to eight hours overnight. Um, so what are you focusing on? in that short period of time that you're closing to do that midday cleaning? You know, I, th I think it's um, mainly the high touch areas, trying to get the door handles and the high touch areas on the cardio equipment. But I, I also look at it as an opportunity for my staff to regroup and collect themselves and kind of um, keep their heads on straight. I don't know about y'all, but when I go to the grocery store and I actually have to go in instead of doing curbside <clears throat> because it's not available for curbside, um, there's a little, there's an increased level of stress that goes on. And I could only imagine putting myself in my staff's position of dealing with and con coming into contact with people uh, hour after hour. I kind of just looked at it as a win-win all across the board. So I'm also looking at it as a regroup phase for my team. Christian, did you have anything to add from the a and perspective? Uh, so we will close uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. Uh, we won't have the closures on Saturdays and Sundays, but we're operating pretty limited hours both of those days as well. Um, pretty similar, focusing on the high-touch areas, counters, handrails, doorknobs. Uh, the strength and conditioning staff will clean all the equipment in the strength and conditioning room uh furniture all that type of stuff uh something interesting that uh kurt from ohio state just put in the comments was they've been talking about um using different facilities for different populations so kurt do you want to touch on that a little bit for the group sure nothing's been decided but it, it, we had a zoom call this morning as our for our reopening uh group and that was one thing that came up was using uh, one of the smaller satellite facilities for uh, senior retiree, you know, compromised individuals, similar to what a lot of grocery stores and retail facilities are doing now, like the six to seven or seven to eight or whatever the first hour of the business is. So rather than making it the first hour of business, just having a separate facility uh, to do that. Thank you. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Anyone um, have any, you know, a burning question uh, that they're, you know, came into their mind and, you know, wants to kind of brainstorm with the group about or something that they've been thinking about that they'd like to see what, what we can come up with as a, through conversation. 
I have one. I'm sorry, I just realized I wasn't muted all this time, Joe, but it didn't affect everyone. No, you're um, good. Again, it's, it's Nino here from Ryerson. Um, markings on floors. And, I mean, I've stayed home, um, so I don't go up to the grocery stores and we get groceries delivered. So I'm not seeing how stores or places are demarking the floor to allow for that so social distancing. Like, how do you control which direction people walk in? And if you put a piece of tape on the floor, I don't know about students at your schools, but students at ours, they disregard signs and tape lines and walking blindly. So I'm just not sure, how would you mark the flooring to allow traffic flow or to control how far apart people are? So I personally haven't seen much. I'm kind of like the only place I went, I last weekend I went to Costco just because they weren't delivering to where we were anymore. Um, and we desperately needed some stuff. Um, and they had, they didn't have the one way aisles, I think primarily because the aisles at Costco are so wide that you can still work to maintain um, the distance, but it was, uh, they were limiting how many people went in the store at a time and they had, when you were waiting outside, they had created, you know, some stanchions out of empty pallets um, in their cart waiting area and they marked every six feet with a piece of tape. Um, and for the most part, I think it worked because those Costco carts are so huge, you can't get that close to anybody anyways, but I've also seen it other places. And for the most part, I feel like, you know, I'm not going to say there's not a rogue person because we all know that just like you mentioned, the students don't read the signage, but, um, I do <laughs> think you wrote, put an arrow on their phones. Down, yeah. Once you put the lines down, I think if people are standing in a line, they don't necessarily have a challenge with it, but. I think the more you get them moving, like whether it's the arrows in a store or through a facility, that could present some challenges um, as far as that goes. But anyone else have any thoughts about that? Uh, TJ at Mac, we're actually looking at um, creating some vinyl floor stickers that will last uh, wear and tear and just try and make it incorporate it with some of our branding, but um, we'll be, you know, hey, you know, marauders keep six feet apart or some catchy phrase on them to try and grab their attention. It'll also be something that is very different in our facility that we don't have. So it, it may catch their attention a little bit more there. Um, and then obviously, as I'm sure everybody else is doing some additional signage and stuff that they're not going to read. Um, as much as everyone thinks uh, us Canadians are all that nice, some of them are pretty ignorant. <laughs> um, but we have... Um, uh, we are trying to look to change it up and take down some of the um, potential signage that's been up for a long time and just update some stuff to just change the look and feel to try and grab some attention. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Brian Mills, UH Clear Lake. We're also using, uh, we're going to remove all of our Neptune commercials and we will be kind of replicating the, the sounds that play in the, um, Free stores when you're there so just reminding patrons um, social distancing hygiene things on those lines um, so that's also going to be another audio for us I also see a question here from Jess about uh, if people are going with more bigger than the six feet and I know that on the risk management call yesterday, Olivia, she's at Columbia in New York, was talking about a 10-foot um, span. That was the recommendation in New York for exercising participants. Um, I looked, she's not on this call to um, kind of go into more detail about that, but I know that New York had been talking about 10 feet. So shifting things back in the last few minutes to, you know, how we take care of our staff. Um, what are all your universities looking at? How's your department trying to go about obtaining different PPE, whether that's, you know, masks, um, gloves, hand sanitizer, those kinds of things. Have you gotten those as a department? Or are you leveraging, you know, larger purchasing power of the university itself? Um, what will you be providing and, and trying and how are you, you know, getting your hands on those materials for your staff that are working, whether that's full time or, you know, our part time staff.
I just have a couple of unique situations for us here at Nebraska. I just wanted to share, but our, our innovation campus um, was working with the, the ethanol corn board and they ended up making hand sanitizer. And so we have hand sanitizer that is very um, pleasurable in our community and we can just go in and request that. Um, so that's been, been pretty amazing. Um, same thing with cloth masks. Those are actually being manufactured by our, our state penitentiary. And then we can put in a queue to have those picked up for the sewn uh, mask and have those laundered. But um, I think, again, most of it has all been coordinated through our emergency operations center. So if you haven't visited with those folks on campus or your environmental health and safety, um, they are looking at using the purchasing power of the system and not just our own institution. Um, to acquire some of those things because again everywhere you turn everywhere you look back order back order back order so I, I definitely think you should explore those those higher purchasing power type um, conversations. This is Justin Kern from Arizona State University. Uh, what we've looked at um, for first aid we're going to stay with nitrile gloves but for cleaning knowing how many gloves we're going through are going to go through, we have, we're going to move to food handler gloves that can handle chemicals. Um, and you can get those. I was actually able to order 16,000 of those in the last two days. So they are, they're not medical grade. Um, we're ordering those in clear and then we're going to keep all of our medical or emergency response gloves in blue. So that's going to be a way for us to work around it. But there's a company out of St. Louis that has a ton of those gloves. Uh, let me see if I can find the name. It's a paper company. But if you look up food grade gloves and then just make sure they can handle bleach and clean. But they are available. So Ross is um, and Jess are talking a little bit in the chat about um, moving equipment and how are you marking off equipment and a couple things that um, have come up in some calls I've been on is at one school they were asked for their gym space to be turned into classroom space because it's so large that um, their basketball courts are going to be turned into classrooms because that was their plan was to move equipment into their basketball court but now they can't do that. Is anybody else experiencing things like that? We have that ask right now for a lab that they're looking at and they want to find different places on campus that have wide open spaces that are 2000 square feet plus. And so um, that's a conversation we're having right now. Nothing's been decided, but it will change our game plan of, of what we decide to do if that becomes a priority. We have about seven minutes left. Anyone else got um, anything they want to bring up to the group? Or if I've missed anything in the chats, by all means, <laughs> by all means, please feel free to bring that back up. There was something back a while ago in the chat where someone was talking about, um, Blake had mentioned that as you have patrons come in about, hi, how are you today? And this is what you need to know about working out here. So is there some thoughts, I guess, on how people are gonna educate patrons as to, you know, if the floor sticker isn't working or um, putting the stanchion around the cardio equipment isn't working, what are some other ideas people have in educating um, users about what they need to be mindful of? So hey, what Amy, oh, sorry. I was just going to, I'm going with uh, Glenn's question about concerns about responding to emergencies. One conversation that came up in a meeting I was in today was moving from CPR layperson to CPR for the professional rescuer, because then you can use a, v, a BVM instead of having to get down and use a mask. Um, that's honestly something I hadn't thought of, and I think it's a great idea. However, that transition would be huge for like a 500 person staff at some point. So that was one thing that was talked about um, that has been talked about that I know of. And Aaron, I'd add, um, so we talked about that and our uh, risk management person had brought up, we have the, um, the actual valve masks in all of our uh, first aid kits and such. And no, as opposed to this, the, the sheet, 
you can put on and those are all one way valves as well so again it doesn't i'm talking about the bag valve mask uh, yeah bag valve mask yeah i was just saying what our staff was using just so we don't have to switch the total certification was we already have the pocket uh, or the actual valve mass um, that are that have the one-way valve. So that's something kind of in the interim between if you just only had the sheets, maybe you could purchase those masks so you don't have to totally switch your certification to if that's kind of the middle ground that works better for your situation. Yeah. Hey, Aaron, uh, it's Jake. Um, something that we discuss as far as that goes for our EAP is having all of our lay responders respond only with um, chest compressions until either one of our lifeguards or facility supervisors, somebody that's always in the building who is CPR pro can arrive with one of our BBMs. Jake, have you run that past legal? Um, not yet. It's just in our, that's our, uh, I guess our, our current best option for for running past legal for reopen, but yeah. we're just now starting to together that plan. I'd be interested to hear what they thought about not going to the full scope of their training. I, that would that would be an interesting conversation. So the argument we saw for that is um, protecting the rescuer first. And if if uh, resuscitation, sorry, um, oh, does the rescuer at harm, Got then, it. yeah, then we might be able to argue with that chest compressions only would be viable until somebody was able to arrive with the BBM. Awesome. Until we can, I mean, if, until we can look into certifying everybody as CPRO, but that would be less feasible for reopen immediately. So one last thing that we hadn't brought up yet, but I know we talked about on the last call was, um, and, and Ryan from uh, Sonoma State brought up the their facilities being, you know, is actively, it sounds like being used as a satellite site host facility for COVID positive patients. So um, is anyone go, you know, actively or, or preparing to host um, those kinds of uh, situations? right now since you know we last spoke a couple weeks ago that if you know could connect to ryan or ryan if you want to share what you've been going through just to provide that insight so if someone you know has that then you know they can get your your information from you not not so much uh right now but we're going to be going through a lot in a little bit so thanks for the shout out and um if, it, if it, anybody wants to connect feel free to reach out All right, anyone have any, we got two minutes left, so any last item that anyone wants to bring up? It looks like waivers were a conversation. Oh, okay. And I know that waivers can be tricky situations because I know some states allow waivers and some states don't. So um, they're tricky, but has anybody started to rework theirs if they do have them? We haven't talked about really reworking them. Um, our risk management person and I talked about, is that something we want to look at? And this isn't based off an article or any research I've read. Just my personal perception was, if we're reworking whatever waiver we already have, are people going to get the feeling that we're not doing as much as we can to keep the facility clean? Because like, all right, well, we're doing the best we can, but we want you to sign something extra. So if we don't do as good of a job, then it's not a big deal. Um, kind of thing. So that's just my own personal, like I said, not based on any science, anything I've read. That was just my comment to our risk management person about if we wanted to create an additional waiver. And I, I was like, I just don't think that engenders a lot of confidence um, in our facility and, and how we're going to go about doing things. One other thing that we missed back a little bit ago was um, Amanda Simmons has been asking about people's staffing plans and trying to increase staff, but then also having budget implications. So that may be something that if someone's had to deal with that, could reach out with her directly just because we're running a little low on time. But that was something else that's out there that looks like a, a concern for individuals. 
All right. Well, thanks everyone um, for the engagement. This was great. We had heard the last few, uh, just a few different ones that people had kind of struggled. Um, again, with just stuff being so up in the air, it's hard to engage sometimes. So um, we did a great job, Phil, now, or I'm sure we could fill, you know, more time. So, you know, we'll, I don't know what nurses' plans are moving forward. And, you know, we maybe don't need to reconnect in a week, but perhaps later in the summer or something. So we'll see what NURSA um, is thinking about with the other feedback they've gotten from the other round tables. But uh, just from our group, we appreciate all the engagement. I know, like I said, I've gotten a ton out of these, even just as the moderator. So, um, you know, appreciate seeing a lot of your faces uh, that I know, seeing new faces, um, and really just hope everyone's doing well and, and hanging in there. So, um, everybody have a good weekend, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see each other again soon. Thanks.